The Boy at the Bottom of the Fountain Written by J. Bell Narrated by Charlie David Was there a better place in the world than a shopping mall? They were bright, dry, and comfortable, regardless of how much rain or snow pummeled the building. Every consumer desire could be found under that protective roof, including a wide spectrum of greasy cuisines and sweet treats guaranteed to increase the waistline. Better-fitting clothes were just a short waddle away, along with countless other delights, no matter the shopper's age. Hyperactive kids, obnoxious teenagers, stressed-out adults, speed-walking senior citizens, each had a place here, in a little slice of paradise where every basic need was met. Shopping malls could also be the worst place on earth, especially for a 14-year-old boy who had spent most of the day in shoe stores and women's clothing departments whilst in the company of his mother. If it wasn't for the warm, fuzzy feelings he had toward malls, he never would have agreed to join her. Darling, could you help me, please? Shane snapped out of his philosophical musings to notice shopping bags being thrust toward him. More dead weight for him to carry. Not that his mother wasn't doing her fair share. As they left the store, both her hands were filled with bundles of plastic handles. This made progress slow and tedious as they dodged other shoppers. Shane felt like a blimp drifting down the mall corridor, light but unwieldy bags puffing out from either side of him. Are you almost done? He complained. His mother exhaled in exasperation, like the question was too daunting to consider. Their family had an excessive number of birthdays this month, including a pair of cousins, both his sisters, his aunt, a grandmother on one side and a grandfather on the other. His mother seemed determined to finish shopping for all of them in a single trip. Shane didn't want to drive all over Kansas City either, but even he was tiring of them all. I've lost track, she answered at last. Like a turn signal, she tilted her head to the left and moved through the crowd to the center of the corridor, where a square fountain doubled as a place to sit and recover. The backless stone benches there were wide enough to fit six, but once Shane and his mother had plopped down in the middle of one, the bags took up the remaining space. Oh, let's see, his mother murmured, working through a mental checklist. We bought that terrible perfume Granny Joe likes, the coat that Julia keeps asking for, and another in a size smaller for when Annie asks for the same thing. She turned a stern gaze in Shane's direction, preempting a smart-ass comment. Don't make fun of your sister. You'd do the same if you had an older brother to look up to. If I was a creepy clone of him, maybe. Annie was born in a test tube. Admit it. She isn't a clone. Oh, I almost wish she was. That was the worst labor of my life. I pushed so hard, I thought I'd turn inside out. Yuck. His mother didn't seem to hear him. Her eyes narrowed in concentration. Did we get anything for Gwen? The lacy thing? Shane muttered, face burning at the memory. They had spent nearly an hour in a store filled with women's bras and undergarments. What a way to start the day. No need to be embarrassed, his mother said, her tone warm. Before long, you might find yourself shopping there for a special girl. Shane sincerely doubted that. So far, he had heard precisely zero of his friends talk about buying undergarments as gifts for anyone, not to mention their non-existent girlfriends, although they were becoming increasingly obsessed with a variety of female classmates. He just wasn't sure why. His mother turned in the direction of that dreadful store. Maybe we should go back and find something nice for Faith. Ugh, I'd rather vomit, Shane said. Can't you get the rest some other day? I'm almost finished. Only one more. No, two more things. What have I done to deserve this? Shane whimpered. 
he was tempted to fall backward into the fountain so he could die a merciful death. Drowning had to be better than this. He glanced over his shoulder to see if the water would be deep enough and noticed something at the bottom, flat and rectangular. Tell you what, sweetheart, his mother said, pulling his attention away. Why don't I park you here and get the rest on my own? Would you like that? Yes, Shane answered instantly. Okay, I shouldn't be too long. If you need me, Shane tuned out the rest of the lecture. His mother still treated him like he was a little kid, which is why he got dragged along on shopping trips instead of being allowed to stay home. His mother worried way too much. Once she was gone, Shane sat there and watched people walk by, trying to guess what sort of lives they led from their appearance alone. He was sure the messy-haired man who kept scratching his arms was a serial killer, for instance. Or the lady with the loose-fitting jacket? Shane decided she must be a compulsive shoplifter, stealing only for the thrill. He enjoyed this game, although when someone his own age walked by, especially in a group, he pretended to be preoccupied, like this is how he preferred to spend his Saturdays. Alone at the mall, insulated by shopping bags instead of hanging out with his friends. Ugh, so uncool. When some girls decided to sit on a neighboring bench, he angled his body away from them, ignoring their stares and giggles. He pretended to take an interest in the fountain instead. That's what it was there for, right? People were supposed to appreciate its beauty. Or make a wish, judging from the scattered coins at the bottom of the water. Most were pennies. Small wishes. He saw a few nickels and dimes too. Shane was searching for quarters when he noticed the flat rectangle again. Leaning closer to see past the reflections on the water, he realized that it was a photo. A headshot of a guy with a wide smile and blonde hair brushed to one side. A school photo, judging from the wallet-sized dimensions. Shane had spent a good hour cutting out his own pictures from the solid sheets before proudly distributing them to friends and relatives. For the first time ever, he felt good about the way his school photos had turned out. Shane had buzzed his red hair short to eliminate the curls and smiled extra big to show that his teeth were no longer covered in metal wires. He was finally starting to look less like a boy and more like a man. A little kid no more. Is that why the girls seated near him continued to stare? This made him uncomfortable rather than proud. Shane wished his friends were here. They always knew how to handle these situations. He didn't, so he continued his study of the sunken photo. Was the guy from his school? Shane didn't recognize him, although it was hard to be sure from his current vantage point. The water wasn't deep, but it was shimmering, the jets in the fountain's center creating constant ripples that distorted the image. He wanted to reach in and grab the photo, although he would rather do so when nobody was looking. They might think he was scrounging for coins and stealing wishes. Or... They might think he had an unhealthy fixation on the photo itself, because anyone else would probably leave it there. That smiling face, though. Shane wanted to see it up close, just to understand the details better. Like the notch missing from the center of one eyebrow. Was it a scratch on the photo's surface? Had a barber shaved it that way to add a stylish flair? Or did a scar there prevent the hair from growing back? Shane rolled up the sleeves of his shirt, intending to reach into the water. He glanced around before doing so. One of the girls waved. How annoying. Why wouldn't they go away? He used to love girls. His guy friends were often consumed with proving which of them could run the fastest or hit a ball the farthest. When they would rush off to play sports, Shane would often find an excuse to hang back and chat with his female friends, preferring to talk and laugh with them. He knew from those conversations that girls felt competitive with each other too, but that pressure disappeared in a mixed-gender friendship. In theory. 
Lately, he had felt a new kind of pressure, not just from his boob-obsessed guy friends who had stopped teasing him for hanging out with girls and were now asking for details, but from the other side as well. Christina thinks you're cute. How come you aren't dating anyone? Ashley wants you to eat lunch with her tomorrow. Oh yes, girls were interested in more than simple conversation these days, and for whatever reason, that made him want to run and hide. Like now. Shane didn't wave back at the group of girls. He managed a half-hearted smile, so as not to be rude, before turning away. That's when he noticed his mother returning, a shopping bag in each hand. Her face was a mask of forced patience, which meant she was done with this place too. Time to leave. Without the photo? Shane glanced around while rolling up his sleeves. His mother had slowed, as if trying to remember where exactly she'd left him. The girls were watching him while whispering to each other. From across the mall corridor, he caught the eye of a security guard who sized him up. Shane stared back with his most innocent expression until the man decided he was no longer of interest. As for the boy in the fountain, he kept smiling, as if certain that he wouldn't be abandoned there. And he was right. Shane leaned over, gripped the bench with one hand, and plunged the other into the water. Despite the urgency he felt, he pinched the glossy paper with exceptional care lifting it like someone developing a photo in a darkroom. Shane let it drip dry for the precious few seconds he could spare, staring in wonder because the boy was even more handsome now than he could be seen clearly. Handsome? No, no, no. That wasn't the right word. Admirable, like the muscular bodies of athletes on TV. Shane admired their athleticism rather than finding them attractive, right? He tore his eyes away from the photo long enough to notice his mother heading directly for him. She would want to know what he was doing. He could hear the girls discussing it, one of them declaring, Ew, that water is nasty. I wouldn't touch it. Germs didn't matter, nor did anything else except the need to protect his newfound treasure. Shane placed the photo against the skin of his forearm, like he was applying a temporary tattoo and pulled his shirt sleeve down over it. Safe and hidden from sight, he hoped. Ah, <sighs> all done, honey, his mother said with a heavy sigh as she added more bags to the pile. Did you find something in the fountain? No, Shane lied. I thought I saw a silver dollar, but I was wrong. Oh, are you ready to go home? Yes, home to the privacy of his room, where he could do a better job of preserving the photo, because he was already certain he would be staring at it more while trying to solve the mystery. Not of how it had gotten into the fountain or who the boy was, but why it all made him feel so funny inside. A baby shower was no place for a grown man, even a gay one. Shane liked babies. That wasn't the issue. They were soft and cute and appreciated silly voices. 27 years ago, he had even been a baby himself. Shane simply couldn't muster the same sort of enthusiasm that the women here seemed to exude. He had tried his best for his cousin's benefit. Gwen had embraced him with open arms when he had come out, nearly a decade back. Now, he wanted to be equally supportive. That became more and more challenging as the party wore on. A demonstration of a breast pump had made him squirm, but the funny anecdotes about accidental flatulence during labor pulled him right back in, briefly. From there, the topic moved to the best home remedies for stretch marks and, to his great discomfort, saving leftover blood from the umbilical cord and placenta, which apparently had potent medical benefits. Just when he thought he couldn't get any more squeamish, one of the expectant mothers asked, What exactly does it smell like when your water breaks? Shane had discreetly removed himself from that conversation and found a nice empty wall to lean against. He knew he was being immature. Why balk at natural functions of the human body? It's just that 
he never expected to need such knowledge, and the topic really did seem more suited to women. He worried this attitude might be considered sexist, but hey, he didn't see any other men here discussing the best strategies for needing to pee while in the throes of labor. Except for that guy. The only other person of the male gender at the baby shower. He had shown up halfway through, hugging cousin Gwen and kissing her on the cheek. Since then, the man had moved from group to group, seemingly comfortable no matter the subject, or so it appeared from a distance. Shane had been watching him for the past half hour, even while fighting against the urge, but his eyes kept returning to the man, and the notch of hair missing from his right eyebrow. What were the odds that it would be in the exact same spot and be the same triangular shape as the one of his former boyfriend? So to speak, some things were even more embarrassing than natural body functions. Shane continued to watch the man from the sidelines. He had stared at the photo so often in his youth that he could mentally conjure it up now with perfect recall. He attempted to age the features by ten years or so, the man's hair was darker than the boy's, a light brown instead of blonde, but that made sense. He still parted it on the right, although no longer by blow-drying it. Instead, the part was natural, or maybe assisted by a styling product. None of this was definitive proof. So much could change between adolescence and manhood, but not everything. A cocky grin, for instance, would be a dead giveaway. The man Shane observed had smiled a few times so far, but not with the youthful abandon of someone posing for a yearbook photo. As casual as he was trying to be, Shane must have stared too often or too long, because the other man glanced over, catching him in the act, and grinned. Like the finale of a vanishing act, the boy in the photo reappeared before his very eyes. The smiling eyes were each a glimmering sapphire, below them a wide stretch of slightly crooked teeth on full display, like a boy raised by wolves who had never lost his wild streak. Shane felt his heart working overtime to send blood rushing to his face, and other places too, probably out of association because he hadn't always been idle when staring at that old photo. The boy, no, the man from the bottom of the fountain, tore his eyes away long enough to excuse himself from those around him. Then he looked directly at Shane and began walking in his direction. This wasn't good. Shane had a boyfriend, which was only a problem if the other person was gay and interested. Maybe he was just a straight dude who thought he had found another guy to talk football with. If so, he needed to turn down the unintentional bedroom eyes the confident strut didn't help either, nor did the pink dress shirt straining against the tight body. As for the upward nod that was followed by another smile, Shane felt weak in the knees, but he still summoned enough strength to slide along the wall until a potted plant forced him to turn and walk around it. He kept going all the way to the kitchen. Once there, he set down his drink, placed both his hands on the counter, and exhaled. Sometimes dreams come true, whether you're ready for them or not. Hey, the man said as he entered the kitchen. His voice wasn't the same as Shane had always imagined it. Not quite as deep, but still nice. How's it going? He replied. Unable to maintain eye contact, Shane straightened up the mess on the counter instead, stacking used paper plates so they took up less room. Only other guy at the party, huh? The man said. Yes, well, I'm expecting a child of my own and thought I should see what a baby shower is all about. Oh, are you adopting or... Sorry, I just assumed that, uh, your wife is pregnant, I take it? It was supposed to be a joke. Shane should have rubbed his stomach like he was pregnant to help sell it. Instead, he had bombed. I don't have a wife, he mumbled. Or a baby on the way. I'm just full of delusions, and when I get nervous, they come bubbling out. In that case, the man said, jerking a thumb over his shoulder. 
You should get in on this amazing conversation about burping I just left. You'd be surprised how many ways there are to deal with sudden eruptions. Shane laughed. Oh no, more bodily fluids. Please. Fine by me. The man's carefree grin came out of hiding again. So, I make you nervous? Is that why you ran in here? No, I needed another drink. Shane grabbed his glass, which was full enough to slosh wine onto the counter. Oh, crap. Here. The man reached for a roll of paper towels hanging beneath the cabinet and tore off a few before handing them over. Shane kept his head down, too embarrassed to make eye contact. Forgive me if this is too forward, the man said, but I noticed you watching me in the other room in a way that most guys don't. Shane's hand froze in mid-wipe. He looked up, spluttering an explanation. I didn't mean to stare. It's, it's just that you look like somebody I used to know, and I was trying to figure out if you were him. Not that it matters if you are, because I, I don't even know his name, so just ignore the whole thing. Please? The man was quiet, his expression disappointed. Then he shrugged, and as he turned away, he said, No problem. Damn it. Shane watched him leave the kitchen, feeling like an absolute fool, because he had finally gotten what he wanted. Except in his fantasies, everything had been perfect. Colby always knew what to say when Shane felt awkward and uncertain. Colby would make a joke, lean in close, and do things that would make Shane's body tense and his heart melt. The name alone brought back countless comforting memories. And now Colby, or someone who looked just like him, was leaving, disappearing back into the mists of impossible dreams. Wait! Shane dashed from the room and caught up to the man. Hey, sorry, I, I was staring. You're right, uh, but not for the reason you might expect. He grimaced and shook his head. Oh, this is going to freak you out, especially if I'm right, but he sighed and pulled out his wallet. In one of the deeper pockets, beneath forgotten customer loyalty cards, was a worn photo. He slid it free with care as he always did, and even though the edges were soft and the waterlogged paper had never completely flattened, the photo's protective coating had done its job and preserved the image of a smiling boy. Shane compared it to the man standing in front of him, the last of his uncertainty dissipating, and turned the photo around before holding it up. Look familiar? The man's mouth fell open. Then he laughed. <laughs> Uh, that's me. Are you a magician or something? Is this a party trick? I don't know what's going on, Shane said, his face flushing again. Um, I don't suppose your name is Colby? The man shook his head. I'm Luke, but that photo is definitely me. My mom has a bigger version hanging on the wall in the family room. Where did you find that? Did we know each other in high school? We used to date, Shane said, laughing nervously. Luke's brow furrowed. I would have remembered that and been happy about it, quite frankly. Wow, uh, thanks. So you're gay? Yeah. Yes! Shane pumped his fist in the air. Oh, you have no idea how long I've been wondering about that. Luke shook his head. I'm completely lost. I'll tell you everything, Shane said, shortly before I die of embarrassment. In that case, Luke said, nodding toward an empty couch. Let's make ourselves comfortable. Uh, okay, what are you drinking? I can't do this sober. Luke preferred beer over wine. That was surprising. Colby had more sophisticated tastes. Exquisite wines, champagnes, and on occasion fancy bourbons and such. All of these were, in reality, whatever Shane could sneak from his parents' supply and drink in the privacy of his room. 
How romantic. He thought about this while returning to the kitchen, knowing that it was only one of many mortifying secrets. Was he really going to confess them all to a total stranger? Too late now. After returning to the couch, handing Luke his drink, and sitting down with one of his own, he launched into his story before he could lose his nerve. I found your photo at the mall when I was younger. Instant crush. Oh, I thought you were the handsomest guy I'd ever seen. Which messed with my head because I hadn't fully realized I was gay at that point. I did a lot of active denying whenever my thoughts drifted in that direction, but I hadn't let myself admit it yet. Am I making sense? Luke nodded. I went through that around the same age. Oh, maybe it's normal then? Uh, so anyway, I had this confusing obsession with you, and I couldn't figure out why. I always liked people watching, though. I would make up stories about anyone I saw, and that's what I did with you, Colby. Colby? Luke said, scrunching up his nose. What a cheesy name. It's a cute name, Shane retorted. Then he got the joke and smiled. I don't know how I came up with that. Made it up along with everything else, I suppose. I had your entire backstory figured out. Luke's blue eyes were sparkling, like he found the notion charming. Tell me all about myself. Okay. For starters, you lived on a ship, the big kind with masts and sails like pirates used to have. A ship, Luke echoed, in Kansas City. Fantasies don't have to make sense, Shane countered. You didn't even have parents. I believe they were lost at sea. A common hazard of living on a pirate ship in the Midwest. Shut up. Shane said with a grin. I was 13, maybe 14 at the time. Ah, Luke said, as if this put it all into context. I was your George Glass then, your imaginary boyfriend. Exactly, except I didn't make you up to impress my family. Nobody knew about you. Our love was a forbidden secret. Luke smiled. Did you really love me? Yes. Shane admitted. We were pretty serious. When all my friends were out on dates with their girlfriends, you and I went to the movies. We shared burgers in my car. You danced with me in my bedroom when everyone else was at the prom. And you said all the things I needed to hear when I felt sad and alone. How sweet, Luke said without sarcasm or judgment. I'm happy I could be of service to you. There were times I needed that, too. You don't think it's dumb? No, not at all. I pretended I was dating Ricky Martin for a while. He was mostly interested in one thing, though. Colby and I did a lot of that, too. <laughs> and? Was I any good? Shane bit his bottom lip before answering. You were amazing. Until a real boyfriend finally came along. What? Luke placed a hand over his chest, as if pained. You ditched Colby for someone else? Sorry. There's just something about a guy being real that I find irresistible, you know? Luke snorted. Oh, you're joking, but I'm still looking for that. I meet a lot of guys, but so few of them are real. In the figurative sense, at least. How did Colby react to this news? Shane sighed at the memory. He pulled up the anchor of his ship and sailed off into the horizon. I didn't think I'd ever see him again. Of course, when my first boyfriend dumped me, Colby showed up out of the blue, said he could hear me crying all the way from the South Sea. I had grown up a little by then, so he returned on a houseboat instead of a pirate ship. But you two were back on again? Shane tittered to himself. <laughs> Until I found my next boyfriend, yeah. Stone cold, man, Luke said, shaking his head. How often did Colby have to be your rebound guy? All the way until the end of high school? By then it was feeling a little weird. The older I became, the younger Colby started to look. 
I tried pretending that a gypsy curse was making him age backwards, but at a certain point, I couldn't get past it. And yet, Luke said mischievously, you still have that photo in your wallet. Because of what it symbolizes? Colby was the first person I came out to. He was my first everything. And even though it was all in my head, that didn't make it any less important. I went into that first relationship feeling like I had real experience. I tried to treat the other guy like Colby always treated me. So he was still with me in that way. Brace yourself for more cheesiness because to this day, I still credit him for giving me the confidence to chase after my dreams. And did they come true? Shane leaned back and exhaled. Oh, that's a big question. I'm out to everyone these days, so in that sense, yes. I'm dating a really great guy, too. Colby would be heartbroken, Luke said. I know, because that's how I'm feeling right now. <laughs> you flatter me just as much as he always did. I wish we'd met while I was still single. I wanted that to happen so bad. I used to search the crowds for you when I was younger. No kidding. But to answer your question, I guess the important parts of those dreams did come true. As for the rest, we were supposed to live on an island together, Robinson Crusoe style. Colby always promised to build me a mansion with trained animals as servants. The parrots were going to be the maids and use their tails to dust things. We would have had a chimpanzee butler and, if I remember right, an octopus chef. Sounds expensive. Is your current boyfriend rich? Ha! I wish. All of this was to be paid for by sinking other ships on the high seas. Only the bad guys. We were going to be pirates who only pirated other pirates. My own twisted version of Robin Hood. Steal from the thieves and keep it all for yourself. Colby had the houseboat at this point, which made the story even more ridiculous. Any chance that dream can still come true? Because it sounds fun. Alas, the only thing I sink these days are bath bombs. Shane rolled his eyes at his own joke. I'm a manager at one of those lotion and bubble bath stores at the mall. Oh, really? Which one? I get all of my pirate booty over at Oak Park Mall. Shane perked up at this news. Is that how you know Gwen? She's a manager at Nordstrom. Luke nodded. That's right. Gwen is my boss. Ha! She's my cousin and has been bossing me around my whole life so I can relate. He grinned and shook his head. I work over at Legends Outlets. It's ironic that we both have mall jobs because that's where I met Colby. Luke smirked. Really? From what I've heard so far, I would have expected you to meet while battling poachers in the rainforest or something more exciting. I had a few different origin stories for him, some along those lines. In my favorite, Colby was a merman who had washed up on shore. I had to carry him home to my bathtub and, well, use your imagination. In another, I helped save him from muggers. That's where your eyebrow scar came from. I always wondered about it. I didn't get it while fighting off thugs, Luke said. Although I might start telling folks that. You want the truth? Shane nodded eagerly. Luke sighed. You know how in cartoons you'll see dogs playing tug-of-war with a steak or whatever? I used to clench slices of lunch meat in my teeth and feed them to the family dog that way. She loved it. While she was eating a rawhide once, I tried to play the same game. It didn't go so well. She bit you? Yep, and I learned not to mess with her food. So, anyway, you met Colby at the mall? That's where I found your photo. This is only going to make me sound weirder, but it was at the bottom of a fountain. My photo was? Strange but true. Any idea how it got there? I don't know. Which mall was this? It was over on the Missouri side, so I'm thinking Antioch Center. Remember that one? It's closed down now. 
That's in Gladstone, where I used to live. No idea why my photo would be there, though, especially from that year in particular. The only person I gave it to was Luke Blanched. Oh, I know exactly how it got there. Really? Tell me, I'm dying to know. He shook his head. Ugh, oh, it's embarrassing. More embarrassing than dating a photo of someone you've never met? Luke seemed to weigh this before replying with, Yes, <laughs> then I'll get you another beer. It's two in the afternoon and I still have to work. Same here. Colby would tell us not to worry about it. He'd also want you to sing like a canary. Luke laughed. Then he nodded. Hold off on that beer for now, although I might need one after I've finished my story. It began during my freshman year of high school. Photo Day. More important than homecoming, a bigger game changer than prom. All of Luke's hopes rested on the outcome of this day. No clumsy words, no tedious explanations. Just a photo placed in the hand of the person he loved. That's how it worked. Ryder had taught him that, along with so much else in this strange new environment with its own hierarchy and rules. High school was like a foreign country that had been compressed down to fit inside a two-story building. Valentine's Day existed in this realm too, but according to local customs, that was for celebrating established love, not for confessing feelings. Today was different. Envelopes of school portraits would be delivered into hands drenched in sweaty fear because few things were worse than a bad photo. In such a dire situation, the only viable option was to destroy the evidence and hope for a better result next year, all while hiding feelings that were desperate to be confessed. This was the true intent behind the ritual. Handing your photo to someone special on this day was akin to ripping the heart from your chest and entrusting it to their care. Friends knew to wait until tomorrow before asking. Even teachers and family members would be denied. Only the object of your desire was supposed to receive one. Luke was both nervous and excited. He planned to give his photo to someone with dark, swept-back hair, hazelnut skin, and twinkling brown eyes. Ryder seemed to haunt his dreams as of late, be it day or night. Luke adored everything about him. The way he would puff up his cheeks when doing reps, his husky laugh whenever Luke clowned around for his benefit, and the long conversations that only ended when time ran out. They never seemed to have enough together as of late. As with all important days, so much could go wrong. Luke had barely slept last night, and when he did, he'd had nightmares about opening his photos to discover a booger hanging out one nostril, or that his hair was as messy as a bird nest. Fortune smiled upon him. The actual photos were just as he'd hoped. After inspecting them, Luke pulled out the special scissors he brought from home. They were tiny and kept in his mother's bathroom, so he assumed they were for trimming eyelashes or something similar. Today, the scissors were used to cut out a single wallet-sized photo from its sheet. He had dozens in that size to choose from, which was good, because he couldn't get the edges quite right. He wanted the white border to be exactly the same width on all sides. The love of his life couldn't be given a sloppily clipped photo. That would be unthinkable. So Luke cut and recut, never entirely satisfied with the result. Rejects went back in the folder, so he could try again during the next few classes, which prompted more than one teacher to tell him to put the photos away and pay attention. Luke would only comply until he was no longer being observed. Then he would try again. He wasn't ready by lunch, like he had planned. This only added to the pressure he felt. Luke was sure it was just a matter of time before Ryder was given a photo from someone else from many people, most likely. So he was surprised when sitting down in the cafeteria to discover this wasn't the case. Boom, Chad said, 
shoving a photo of a girl in his friend's faces. Luke was included in this, which was almost a compliment, because Chad usually refused to acknowledge his existence. He only did so when mocking him, which technically this might count as. Tammy Erickson, Chad declared. I bet you didn't see that coming. She probably didn't either, Ryder countered, shoving Chad's hand away. Did you steal that from her locker or something? Nope, I told you. We're study buddies now. She thinks I'm smart. That proves she's stupid, Robbie chimed in. He was Chad's best friend. They spent a lot of time slugging each other in the arm, such as now. Where's yours? Chad challenged. I haven't got one yet, Robbie answered. But I gave mine to Zoe Douglas. She didn't give me hers, but she kept mine, so we'll see. How does that work? Luke piped up. If the other person doesn't want your photo, what do they do? He was ignored, as always, by everyone but Ryder. They don't take it, he explained. You're supposed to hold it out, and if they like you, they accept. Otherwise, they'll shoot you down and you'll be left standing there feeling like an idiot. He speaks from experience, Chad said with a cackle. Oh, remember last time? It'll be the same this year, Robbie said. Nobody wants to date the Arab guy. My parents are from India, dumbass. Ryder shot back, rolling his eyes. And for your information, I have reason to believe that Madison will be giving me her photo. Madison Hawk? The leer slid off Chad's face. No fucking way. They turned as one to gaze across the cafeteria. Luke followed their stares to a table in the far corner, where a girl with freckles and brown hair pulled back into a ponytail was chatting with her friends. She wore a simple t-shirt, her style casual if not boyish. Oh, I want to die and come back as her tennis racket, Chad purred. Why? Robbie asked. All she does is hold it and swing it around. Yeah, Chad replied, reaching down to adjust himself under the table. But think how nice and tight her grip would be. Luke grimaced and focused on Ryder instead. If she gives her photo to you, are you going to accept it? What sort of stupid question is that? Robbie demanded. Ryder's eyes flicked to him and away again. We'll see. Luke remained quiet until lunch was over. He and Ryder always walked to the next class together. They didn't share it, but the rooms were in the same hall. Do you plan on giving your photo to anyone? Luke asked him. Mm, probably not. Ryder admitted. They weren't kidding about last year. I really did get shot down. By who? Doesn't matter. I don't want to go through that again. Luke would still like to know, if only so he could demand an explanation from them, because Ryder was the ultimate catch. He had it all. The looks, the body, the sense of humor and a sensitive side that his other friends never got to see because they were too busy behaving like jackasses. Luke had shared so much with him over the past few months, deeply personal thoughts that he had never divulged to anyone else. Ryder had confided in him too, maybe not about everything. He was guarded whenever the topic of love came up. Luke thought he understood why, since it was a tricky subject for him too. Few others their age faced so much judgment because of the preferences they were born with. Talking about it openly always invited ridicule or worse. That might happen today, but Luke didn't think so. He was certain they were the same. But that didn't guarantee Ryder was interested. Do you want someone to give you their photo? Luke asked. His friend nodded. I'm counting on it. Someone you know. Ryder looked over at him and smiled. Preferably. Luke couldn't help but grin in return. Then I bet they will. After sixth period, probably. That's when it usually happens, Ryder said, speaking with the air of authority granted by his extra year of experience. Everyone realizes that they're out of time, so there's a big rush to get it done then. It's also the best way to avoid suspense, like what happened to Robbie. 
Zoe didn't give him her photo. That means she's probably weighing her options or waiting to see if she gets a better offer. Luke hung on his every word, always craving more. On occasion, he even asked questions he already knew the answer to, if only to hear Ryder's voice. This wasn't one of those situations. He really needed to know how much time he had left to work up his courage. What about after school, like when people are at home? That happens too, although not as often. You'd have to go to that person's house, and if you've never been there before, it can come across as creepy. Luke stopped outside of his classroom. When is it too late? Midnight, I guess. Why? Do you plan on giving your photo to someone? Wait and see, Luke said, feeling daring. Ryder's expression was difficult to interpret, but his words were encouraging. Whoever it is will take the photo right away and give you theirs, I promise. He must know. Ryder had to. They were too alike in that regard, avoiding the subject of love rather than having to fake it. Luke had caught Ryder doing the same on many occasions, and when pressed, his friend was always careful with his pronoun choice, keeping them neutral. Most people didn't do that. Luke said goodbye and walked into the classroom, feeling as if fluffy white clouds were beneath his every step. He felt more certain than ever that this was the right day to confess his feelings, but he was running out of opportunities. He finally managed to cut out a photo with perfect proportions in fifth period and spent sixth trying to decide how he would present it. Should he go down on one knee, or should he hand it over casually and say something confident like, I think we both saw this coming. How about a kiss? Luke gave up trying to plan what was best done spontaneously. Instead, he passed the last 20 minutes of class by watching the clock. He stuffed his books into his backpack during the final minute, and as soon as the second hand touched 12 and the bell rang, he was out of his seat and rushing for the door. The halls were still empty when he hurried out of the classroom, not for long. Soon he was dodging bodies and ducking into a restroom along the way to check his appearance. Then came the moment of truth. Ryder was at his locker, dialing the combination. Luke reached him just as the handle lifted and the door was opened. Good. That gave them extra privacy, creating a small wall that partially hid them from view. Hey, Luke said, feeling lightheaded. He couldn't seem to get enough air into his lungs, I'm really glad we met, he stammered. High school was scary, but you were there, and working out is always fun. I like hanging with you, and stuff. Ugh! The words weren't good enough, failing to convey that a nuclear reactor was breaching inside his heart. Ryder didn't seem to mind his fumbled speech. A dry laugh preceded a smile. <laughs> then let's hang out. Yes, uh, but first... Luke pulled a folded index card from his pocket, the photo trapped inside. He had wanted to keep it pristine and was relieved to see that his precautions had worked. He took the photo and, with a trembling hand, held it out. Here, I want you to have this. Ryder's eyes focused on it before going wide. What are you doing? You weren't supposed to give anyone that today unless... I know the rules, Luke interrupted. Do you? Because this means that you're... Ryder glanced around. Then he leaned in close and whispered, Is that what this is? Luke nodded. Yeah? After swallowing, he added, Are you going to take it? Ryder searched the hallway, perhaps not wanting anyone to see. That was fine. Luke didn't care. The only thing that mattered was if the offering would be accepted. And it was... Ryder took the photo from him, cradling it in his palm as he turned toward the safety of his locker. Luke studied his face at the way his eyes seemed to soften as he considered the photo, a gentle smile lifting his cheeks. Ryder glanced over at him demurely. Then he said, It turned out great. You look handsome. Thanks. Luke nodded meaningfully at the folder leaning inside Ryder's locker. How's yours? Oh, Right. Ryder carefully slid the photo he held into the back pocket of his jeans. 
Then he grabbed the folder and pulled out a sheet. None of them had been cut yet, like he wasn't expecting to need one. Oh, crap. I have scissors, Luke said helpfully, setting his backpack down to rifle through it. After handing them over, he watched Ryder slowly cut out a photo, his excitement building with each side that was completed. Luke could hardly wait, but when the photo was held out to him, he pretended to be hesitant so he could make Ryder laugh. What are you doing? Luke teased. You aren't supposed to give those to another boy unless... I want to make sure that you're sure. I'm anything but sure right now, Ryder said, his chest heaving. Take it, please. Luke reached for the photo without looking directly at it, too fixated on Ryder's brown eyes, which were wet with emotion. It confused him when they moved away from his own, flicking elsewhere in the hall before hardening. Luke felt the tips of his fingers graze the edge of glossy paper, his hand passing through empty air. When he looked down to find out why, he saw that Ryder's arm was now held behind his back. Hey! Luke turned as a girl came bounding down the hall. Madison. She had a photo of herself trapped between middle and index finger, her cheeks slightly flushed. Gotten one of these yet? Yes, Luke was tempted to shout in response, but he understood that their relationship might need to remain a secret, for now. So he took a step back and didn't take it personally when Ryder denied the truth. No, I was just borrowing some scissors so I could... Here. Ryder thrust out the scissors. Luke took them dutifully, noticing the way Madison watched him. Her expression was polite, but it was also clear that she was hoping for privacy. Give us a second, Ryder said. To him, Luke had been dismissed. He walked down the hall a few paces, unwilling to go far before he turned around again. His stomach sank when he saw Ryder handing a photo to Madison. She did a little happy dance before speaking words that Luke couldn't hear. Ryder said something back. She nodded. Cell phones came out, probably so they could exchange numbers. The conversation seemed to drag on forever until she finally noticed a group of friends strolling by, who were clearly attempting to eavesdrop. Madison said something else to Ryder before she left to join them. Luke didn't despair. Not yet. He understood if discretion was needed. Or perhaps Ryder had simply wished to spare her feelings, knowing firsthand what it felt like to be rejected on photo day. Please let that be the reason. What's going on? Luke asked, feeling vulnerable as he approached. Ryder turned to face his locker, avoiding eye contact. I'm meeting Madison at the mall in a little while. Okay, what about us? We'll have to hang out some other time. Afterwards, Luke said, I'll be at home. Cool. Ryder shut his locker, the folder of photos still inside. He finally managed to look at Luke, just before he walked away. But the smile he flashed seemed weighted down with guilt. He didn't need to feel that way. Luke had already forgiven him. His insides were a maelstrom of jealousy and insecurity. But those emotions couldn't touch the purity that filled his heart. All he wanted was to be with Ryder. If that came with sacrifices, so be it. He could put up with anything so long as they were together. Luke went home. Later, after dinner, he obsessed over his appearance in the bathroom mirror, brushed his teeth, and kept his phone nearby at all times. When his family settled down to watch TV, Luke sat outside on the front porch, looking up each time he heard someone pass by, just in case it was Ryder. Long after the sun had set and the world had grown dark, he sent a text. Are you coming over after the mall? I'll be here. No reply. No notification that his text had been read. Ryder was probably being cautious. Luke tried to follow his lead. He sat and waited quietly. When his mother made him come inside to get ready for bed, Luke pretended to settle down before slipping outside to wait again. Should I come to your house instead? He texted at 11 that night. 
Still no answer. A troubling thought occurred to him then. He had convinced himself that Ryder had only taken Madison's photo to spare her feelings. But what if that was the reason his own had been accepted? Out of pity. Luke didn't want to believe that. He got to his feet, moving to the sidewalk so he could look up and down the street. But no matter which way he turned, it remained empty. He stood there staring at his phone for the final ten minutes of the day, like someone counting down the end of the year. When midnight finally struck, he let the phone fall limp at his side. Then he waited some more, just in case, before accepting the truth. He was still alone, but no longer in the dark. I'm really, really sorry, Shane said, knowing the words were inadequate, because it was clear these events still hurt Luke, even when a brave smile was ushered in to hide the pain. Ancient history, Luke said, stretching one arm over his head and then the other. I think I'll have that beer now. I'll get it for you, Shane said. But before I do, what happened the next day? I pretended to be sick so I could stay home, Ryder texted me and asked if I was okay. I told him that everything was fine. From then on, we acted like nothing had happened. He started dating Madison, and I made friends of my own, so I wouldn't have to be around him. I still had the same feelings, but the heartache got to be too much. Unrequited love is a bitch. I've been there too. Then you know how it feels. I learned an important lesson that day. Straight guys make great friends, but that's where the line should be drawn. Ryder and I saw less and less of each other. And after my family moved at the beginning of sophomore year, that was the end of it. I never stopped wanting him, but sort of like you and Colby, meeting my first boyfriend helped put it all behind me. I'm glad. Shane stood, needing some alone time so he could sort through his thoughts. I'll be right back with that beer. Funny how feelings from the past, even when they were imaginary or unrequited, could still feel so intense. He and Luke had both gone on to have actual relationships that were more fulfilling, and yet, all it took was talking about the past for old wounds to reopen. And now, Shane needed to decide if he wanted to pour salt in them, because Ryder wasn't a common name. He doubted there was more than one who was of Indian descent and went to high school in Gladstone. Shane knew Ryder. Intimately. Not the self-denying teenager, but the man he had become. Then again, the truth might be liberating. In the same way that Shane was glad to finally meet the real-life person behind the legend that was Colby, Luke should be given the option to learn the answer to a question he had never dared to ask. One much-needed beer, Shane said when returning to the couch. He was careful not to spill his wine as he sat again. Here's to long-lost loves, he said in toast. To long-lost loves, Luke murmured as they clinked glasses. Did you ever look Ryder up, find out what happened to him? Once, when I was drunk, Luke turned red as he explained. And I mean ridiculously wasted, I found him on Facebook, but his profile is set to private, so I could only see one photo of him. He still looked good. Shane was positive now. Ryder was paranoid about online privacy and hadn't touched his Facebook account in years. Do you want to know what happened to him? Luke took a sip and snorted. <laughs> Why? Did you just Google him? Not exactly. Luke's expression grew serious. You know each other? Is his last name Kermani? Luke sat up. Yes. How could you possibly know that? Did you go to the same school as us? No, I was raised in Overland Park. I still live there. So does he. You're friends with him? Luke noticed the wince and reached the obvious conclusion. More than that? Yeah. Ryder and I have mutual friends. We kept running into each other over the years, but we've only been together now for about six months. 
he's gay? Shane nodded in confirmation. Luke groaned and slumped back into the couch. Ah, oh, I freaking knew it. Except I didn't. I started doubting myself. And I guess it was easier to let go thinking that it was impossible. But it wasn't. Is that what you're telling me? Sorry, Shane said with a grimace. I wasn't sure when you began your story, and by the end of it, I didn't know if I should say anything at all. Luke sat up straight again. I'm glad you did. I want to know everything. Start with the most important part. Did he ever talk about me? Actually, yes. He never went into detail, but he mentioned getting asked out by a guy in high school and not having the guts to date him. Ryder didn't come out until college. Damn it, Luke said, playfully pounding a fist against the padded arm of the couch. All the things we could have done together. My first time could have been with him instead of David freaking Krantz. Was that your first boyfriend? First fling, very one-sided. I was literally thinking of Ryder the entire time. Please don't tell him I said that. Or that I asked if he's hung. Shane laughed. Technically, you didn't, and for the record, he's got nothing to be ashamed of. I figured. I was always staring at his gym shorts when he wasn't looking. Luke shifted on the couch to face him. What's Ryder like as a boyfriend? Is he romantic? Shane thought about it and exhaled. He's practical. Meaning? I don't know. Colby was always bringing me flowers or leaving me presents to find. Some of them were real, even though I had to wrap them up myself. Um, anyway, Ryder is more pragmatic in his approach. He'll say things like, Sure, I could buy you flowers, but they'll only die in a few days. Or I could put that same money into my savings account and buy you a house that'll last forever. Works for me, Luke said, fanning himself theatrically. I'd rather have a house than flowers. Me too, but why can't he do both? Just once, you know? Let there be an exception. Shane shook his head. I don't mean to make him sound bad. He's a super loving guy who shows his affection in other ways. Very family-oriented. Ryder was devastated he couldn't be here today. Unlike me, he actually would have enjoyed it. If he could have gotten the time off. What's he do for a living? He's an accountant. White collar? Luke gasped as if this was ideal. That's my favorite of all the collar colors. Shane laughed. <laughs> you must have been crazy about him if you think number crunching makes him hotter. Hey, we can't all fight pirates for a living. And it sure beats helping old men find pants that go up to their armpits. Or chasing after women with samples of lotion. Shane pulled out his phone to check the time. Then he sighed and set his unfinished wine down. Speaking of which, I need to get going, although I'm tempted to call in sick. Me too, Luke said as he got up. I don't think my boss would fall for it, considering that she's standing right over there. <laughs> it was awesome finally getting to meet you. I hope you're not too disappointed, Shane smiled. Not in the slightest. Good I had fun. Let's do this again. You've got it. They exchanged information. Shane made the rounds, saying goodbye to the people he knew. After wishing his cousin the best, he went back over to Luke, who offered to walk him to the door. They parted with a hug. Shane thought of Colby while wrapped in those arms, and for once, reality lived up to the fantasy. Dinner at my place? I can't wait to hear everything. Ryder meant the baby shower. Shane had grappled with the temptation to tell him the real news, that he had run into someone important from the past, but he resisted, wanting to see his boyfriend's reaction in person. I'm on my way over, Shane texted back, although if you want, we could go out to dinner instead. Name one place in the greater Kansas City area that makes a better risotto than me. Besides, it's a waste of money. Like taking his second Uber of the day instead of asking Ryder to pick him up from work. 
Shane had at least chosen the more economical pooling option, which involved extra stops to pick up other passengers. He enjoyed not being sure which route the car would take and getting to see unfamiliar streets and neighborhoods. Sometimes this resulted in lively conversations, which was fun too. He would do this every day if money wasn't a consideration, although he was unsure if Ryder would approve. His boyfriend would probably have to tally up the sums before deciding how it made him feel. Colby, on the other hand, he would adore carpooling. As much as Shane usually found the meandering routes enjoyable, by the time the Uber dropped him off, he was desperate to get inside the apartment to tell Ryder who he had met at the baby shower. After knocking, he waited impatiently for the door to open, and once it did, he planted a series of pecks on Ryder's lips, each pushing his boyfriend farther back into the apartment. Want me to turn off the oven? Ryder asked, laughing at his behavior. We could make our own heat. No, I'm too hungry, and I have news. About the promotion? Ryder asked, his face clouding with uncertainty. No, better. Then tell me in the kitchen. I just threw in the rice, and I don't want it to burn. Shane followed, checking out his butt along the way. Ryder was still wearing gray slacks and a dark blue dress shirt. He hadn't changed after getting home from work, and as much as Shane had joked about accounting not being a sexy profession, he had to admit that Ryder wore the attire well. It helped that he still liked to work out, not as much as he enjoyed cooking and entertaining, but the love handles were fine with Shane too. He preferred it when his men had some meat on their bones. In the kitchen, he waited impatiently for Ryder to finish fussing over the food. Wine bubbled in the pan and a ladle of broth was poured over the rice before his boyfriend glanced over, expression hopeful. How was it? Did anyone bring actual babies with them? You're so weird, Shane answered, shaking his head. And no, there weren't actual babies there, but there was a cute guy. Oh, how cute? I'll show you. Shane pulled out his wallet and removed the photo. Ryder had never seen it before. Actually, that wasn't true. He must have seen and held the exact same photo ten years ago, although Shane had never shown it to him or anyone else since rescuing it from the fountain. At most, he might have mentioned once having an imaginary boyfriend without going into detail. Colby was always the most sacred of his secrets. Not anymore. Shane would have to open up about his past, but not just yet. He watched Ryder's forehead crease, just as it probably had all those years ago the first time the photo was handed to him. Then his eyebrows shot up at the same time his mouth fell open. Luke? Yep, he was at the party. Now I bet you really wish you'd been there. Ryder was already shaking his head. No, absolutely not. What? Shane felt even more confused when the photo was handed back to him. How come? I would have felt too ashamed to speak to him. Because of what happened? He told me about photo day, which I think is weird, by the way. We didn't do that at my school. He told you? Ryder asked. Yeah. He wasn't bitching about you or anything. He didn't even know that we were dating when it came up because, well, it's a long story, but I'll tell you. But I'm dying to hear your side of things first. Like... When he gave you the photo, did you know that he was gay? Or that you were? Ryder stared in response. I, uh, I had my suspicions about both of us. He noticed that the broth had already cooked off and, swearing under his breath, hurriedly added another ladle's worth to the pan. Here, Shane said, picking up a wooden spoon. I'll take care of that. You tell me everything. Ryder nodded and moved aside. Once certain that Shane had the situation under control, he began his story. Freshman Orientation Ryder's mother had signed him up for it, which was a humiliating enough way to start high school, but the next year she doubled down by insisting he return the favor for other students. The first day of playing babysitter wasn't so bad, 
Ryder had five nervous kids in his care, none of whom responded to his helpful tips. They just stared at him in bewilderment whenever he spoke. Ryder tried his best to pass on useful information to them, regardless, and ended the experience with an offer. If you're still confused, meet me tomorrow, same place and time. The next morning, only two of those students were waiting by his locker, a guy and a girl. He made the same offer again, and on the following day, only one person remained, Luke Holmes. He didn't seem lost anymore, most of his questions about the area rather than the school. Ryder answered each inquiry as best he could, but the kid kept coming back. On the fifth day, the reason became clear. Luke wasn't lost. He was lonely. Which junior high did you go to? Ryder asked him, wanting to confirm his suspicions. Boswell, Luke replied. Never heard of it. Probably because it's in Topeka. My family moved here over the summer. Poor guy. Beginning high school was challenging enough when surrounded by familiar faces. Ryder couldn't imagine doing so among strangers. Have you managed to make many friends? Luke's eyes darted to him and away again. Besides me, Ryder hastened to add. And that's how it began. They always met at the beginning of the school day. They didn't have any classes together, although when Ryder noticed Luke all by himself during lunch, he invited him over to his table. The other guys gave the newcomer hell, a lowly freshman desecrating their territory. But being teased had to be better than sitting alone. It wasn't until the second week that they truly bonded. Luke met him in the morning, as he always did, except this time he didn't look so good. His hair was messed up, the collar of his t-shirt ripped, and his face burned with indignation. What happened? Ryder asked. A bunch of guys tried stuffing me into a trash can? Luke snarled, slamming a fist against the lockers. Ryder resisted a smile, but only because seeing someone so small act so tough was cute. <laughs> did you fight back? Hell yeah, I did. Good. Don't be an easy target, and they'll stop messing with you. Picking on freshmen usually doesn't last too long. I also had a rough time, but after the first month, it got a lot better. Luke wasn't reassured. He kept glancing over his shoulder, like he expected to be attacked again. Maybe we could meet by the buses in the morning. Ryder shook his head. I walk to school. Besides, I can't always be there. You need to stand up for yourself. And you did, which is great. Yeah, Luke said, sounding vulnerable. But there were five of them. Assholes. Ryder rolled his eyes. Hey, do you ever work out? The school is a gym. I'm there most days after sixth period. Really? Luke asked, eyes moving over his body. Is that how you got so... incredibly buff? Ryder finished for him, flexing his arms to demonstrate. At best, he was toned, but he still remembered how huge all the upperclassmen looked when he first started high school. I can't teach you to be a cage fighter or anything cool like that, but you might get a bit bigger and feel more confident. That'll make people think twice before messing with you. I'd miss my bus ride home. Do you have a bike? Luke nodded. Even better, double workout. By this time next month, you'll be bench pressing me. Luke had laughed and agreed. He kept his word too. Any day that Ryder stayed longer to lift weights, Luke was there. Week after week, month after month. They often hung out afterwards just to talk. And when this lasted so long that they were asked to leave so the school could close, they moved elsewhere, to the mall, a nearby park, each other's homes. They became friends not out of pity or desperation. Ryder found himself liking Luke more than he did his other friends, more than just about anyone. They had a connection that only seemed to grow. Luke grew too. He was taller and stronger than when Ryder had first met him. People often assumed they were both sophomores, which made it easier to bring him along to parties and such, but mostly they preferred spending time alone together. Give me ten more, Luke said 
spotting him one afternoon in the school gym. They were taking turns doing bench presses. Ryder was lying flat on his back while Luke stood over him. They were usually comfortable in each other's presence, which made it all the more confusing that, lately, being together felt so awkward. This had everything to do with the way Luke stared. He used to watch Ryder's body when spotting him, searching for any sign that his strength was about to give out. These days, Luke stared into his eyes instead. Such as now. Ryder held his gaze like a contest of wills, but that wasn't right. It was closer to an almost irresistible need to communicate something that transcended words. The current set of reps ended much too soon. Ryder was exhausted and couldn't do more, which was a shame because he didn't want to look away. I'll do another set, Luke said, chewing on his bottom lip. Figure I can push myself a little harder. Good, Ryder said encouragingly, switching positions with him. The recent awkwardness might come from the unnatural arrangement of their positions. While standing over him like this, Ryder's crotch was basically in Luke's face. Perhaps that's why his friend chose to stare past it and into his eyes. A little less creepy that way. Luke was doing well, too. Ryder broke eye contact to check the progress of his body. Luke had begun their workout sessions wearing a baggy t-shirt and cut-off jeans. Now, he owned proper gym clothing, red vinyl shorts, and a gray muscle shirt that hugged his torso. No more trembling arms as the barbell rose and fell. Instead, his muscles stretched and constricted, Luke in full control. That's more than Ryder could say of himself. He was losing control. So he returned his attention to those intense blue eyes, which didn't help. They elicited the same reaction. Lust, with a hint of something more. Fondness, affection, love. That's enough, Ryder said, grabbing the barbell and putting it back on the rack. What's wrong? Luke asked as he sat up. I gotta get home. Uh, you should too. Luke licked his lips and nodded, but he didn't stand. Tomorrow is picture day, right? Photo day, Ryder corrected. He was already sick of hearing about it from everyone. Are you excited? That was one way of putting it. Moving away from Luke to grab a water bottle helped calm him down. Mostly. He needed privacy to sort through the crazy thoughts cluttering up his mind. I've got a jet, he said. Sorry. See you tomorrow, Luke called after him. Ryder was already in the locker room. He grabbed his things and left, breathing out in relief once outside the school. What the hell was that all about? Hormones? He had jacked off last night before bed. Maybe he needed to do it in the mornings instead. Or go back to twice a day, like when he had first discovered how much fun he could have on his own. Worth a try because otherwise this might mean that he was... Ryder's foot met empty air as he stumbled into an intersection. He blinked in surprise and stepped back onto the curb, just as a car whizzed by. He barely noticed, still startled by where his thoughts had led him. He might be... Ryder knew it was possible. This wasn't the first time his thoughts had drifted to other guys, but usually it was sexual and, really, what didn't turn him on these days? This was different. Emotional. He could at least think the word. That would prove he wasn't frightened of it, as if he had something to hide. Gay. There. That wasn't so hard. He might be gay. Big deal. The serenity Ryder felt was soon overtaken by panic as he considered the implications. When he felt a hand land on his shoulder, he freaked out even more, yelping and leaping away. Sorry, Madison said. I didn't mean to scare you. A mischievous glint appeared in her eye. Okay, maybe I did, just a little. You're the worst, Ryder said, bracing his hands on his knees while willing his heart to stop racing. Did it do so out of fear or because of him? Sorry, Madison nudged him gently to get his attention. Come on, the light's changed. They walked home like this on occasion, their houses not far from each other. When they were children, he and Madison used to wait at the bus stop together. 
Their high school was close enough to home that they could walk instead, although they were both eager to get their licenses so they could drive on colder and wetter days. For now, they were on foot, together, when they happened to meet like this. Ryder's friends were always jealous afterwards, obsessing over how hot she was and what they wanted to do with her. Ryder never looked at Madison that way. But maybe he should try? She was wearing tight green shorts with a matching top. She took good care of herself. He admired her athleticism and liked that she was pretty enough not to need makeup. Even now, her skin glowed with a light sheen of sweat, her pulled back hair still damp from exertion. She was something of a tomboy, and yet he found her more attractive than most girls. Why was that? Tennis practice? He asked when she caught him staring. Yep, I never take a shower at school. Too shy. Oh, sorry if I stink. You don't, Ryder said, relaxing a little. Unless I do too, and that's why I can't tell. I always wait until I'm home before I shower. It's more comfortable that way. Right? Being naked at school feels so wrong, and I have my favorite shampoo and stuff at home. Madison made a face. I'm surprised, though. I thought guys liked showing off. And I thought girls wouldn't, um, worry as much as we do. About what? Madison asked. Do you think a guy might turn you gay by checking you out? Because that's not cool. Being gay isn't cool? Or worrying about them looking? He wasn't sure, and he really didn't want to dwell on the subject. Guys worry about how we stack up, you know? Er... Uh, the size issue? Madison perked up and laughed. Really? Oh, same here. Although it's less about size and more about proportions. Who has the perkiest boobs, the narrowest hips, the longest legs? Comparisons are not fun. You don't have anything to worry about, he said. She blushed. That hadn't been his intention. To him, it was a simple fact. His friends often commented on how hot she was, but he wasn't sure if that would be welcome news, because now she seemed uncomfortable, her face pink as she stared at the sidewalk ahead of them. Were you working out? she asked eventually. Yeah. I can tell, she glanced over at him. You look really good. Thanks. He slowed, having reached his house. Madison turned to face him. Tomorrow is photo day. Ryder groaned. Oh, don't remind me. You're not into it? I don't know. Is it because Claire shot you down last year? Ryder hung his head and sighed. Oh, everyone knows about that, don't they? Maybe. All I know is that she regrets it. His head whipped up. Really? Yeah. Does that mean you're going to try again? With her? No way. I'm not giving anyone my photo. I won't put myself through that a second time. But if someone wanted to give their photo to you, Madison pressed, would you take it? That depends. Are you asking for Claire? No, I, I told her to leave you alone. Ryder searched her eyes, trying to find any hint of what he felt with Luke. He liked Madison, always had. They weren't friends exactly, but they talked regularly and had been at each other's birthday parties when younger. She was attractive and nice, down to earth and witty. If there was ever going to be a girl in his life, he couldn't imagine doing better. I'd accept someone else's photo, he said. Yeah. Good, Madison said, fighting down a smile. Then we'll see how it goes tomorrow. With that, she kissed him on the cheek and practically skipped down the street. It was an uncharacteristically girly moment for her, which was off-putting and made him feel confused again. What the hell did he want? Ryder turned toward the house. His mother was in the yard, watering flowers while smiling from ear to ear. She wasn't looking at him, but he had no doubt that she had seen it all. Great. He went inside and took a shower determined to relieve his sexual frustration while thinking of Madison. But in his fantasies, Luke kept replacing her. Irritated by this, he opted for quick relief while thinking of nobody. Ryder was quiet during dinner and shut himself in his room afterwards, claiming that he had homework to do. 
He did, but he ignored it to sort through his thoughts. New theory. Luke was gay, and that's what Ryder was picking up on. It had nothing to do with his own feelings, except he knew that wasn't entirely true. Luke might be interested in him physically, even that he was unsure about. But the affection Ryder felt for him had come from inside. A knock on the door interrupted his ruminations. I don't mean to disturb you, his mother said, which was funny because she most certainly did. Ryder welcomed the distraction. He hopped off the bed and opened the door for her. How are you doing? his mother asked, her English lightly accented. I thought I'd check in on my baby before I go to sleep. I'm fine, Ryder said, gesturing at the open books on his bed. Just finishing up. Oh, his mother walked into his room, seeming to search for something. Do you have an outfit picked out for tomorrow? You want to look nice for photo day. Ryder stared in disbelief. How do you know about that? Your sister told me. Now then, show me what you're going to wear. I have no idea. You'll see my outfit at breakfast tomorrow after I decide impulsively, same as any other day. His mother clicked her tongue like he was being silly. I suppose it doesn't matter. You will look good no matter what you wear, my handsome little boy. Thanks, he grumbled. She always knew how to make him feel like he was still a toddler. Do you have a girlfriend already? I saw Madison kissing you. She's not my girlfriend, Ryder huffed. Oh, but you like her. That's what he'd been trying to figure out, and he hadn't got far on his own. Even though it went against his instinct, he decided to ask his mother. I'm not sure. How would I know? You will simply know, she answered. Is that how it was when you met Dad? Ah, that was different. How so? His mother seemed surprised by his interest. Then she sat on the edge of the bed. As you know, your father and I had an arranged marriage. But you got to meet him first, Ryder said as he joined her. That's correct, but I did not like him. Ryder stared in disbelief. You always said it was love at first sight. When you were younger, yes. Now you are becoming a man, and you must understand how complex these matters can be. It is not that I disliked your father. He was very polite. His mother bowed her head while thinking. Then she held up a finger. What I did not like is being rushed. I wanted to meet someone and fall in love first, like in the movies. So it was not your father's fault. I would not have liked any man I was introduced to in this way. You didn't have a choice? At the time, I did not think so. But I was very lucky, because your father let me take all the time I needed. We did what our families required of us, but in the privacy of our home, we got to know each other slowly. It was not love. That took many years. But I knew I wanted a family. Neither of us wanted to wait for that, and so we didn't. When your sister was born, I told your father that I did not want her to have an arranged marriage like we did. I hurt his feelings on that day, very badly. But we kept talking, and I discovered that there was much he was unhappy about. And so we started a new life together. By moving here? Yes, and by being completely honest with each other. That is when I began to fall in love. Ryder exhaled in relief. So, it doesn't always happen right away? No, not always. True feelings come later, like seeds that have been planted and tended to until they finally break through the soil. For now, you can decide what you want. A family? A career? What sort of person do you want to share your life with? Will they have a career too? Or do they take care of you and the children? Perhaps that will be your role. Try to find someone who shares your dream. The rest will fall into place. Does that make sense to you? It did. He gave her a hug before she left the room. Ryder blew through his homework after that, eager to get it out of the way. Once he was between the sheets, he let himself dream. But he didn't go to sleep. 
he imagined two futures for himself. In one, he and Luke were together. They still worked out, although at the gym they owned and ran together. When they went home at night, it felt empty. Dinner, sex, and then... what? He thought of Madison next. Ryder still bought the gym and managed it. She had her own career as a professional tennis player. When they both got home from work, sweaty and fulfilled, they would sneak a quick shower together before tending to the kids. That mattered to him. Ryder wanted a family. Especially when he thought of the holidays. His parents had always provided a loving environment for him and his sister to thrive in. Ryder had seen the way some of his friends were raised, with meaningless rules and harsh words. His parents had gently guided him while maintaining order. When he looked back on his upbringing, all he saw was happiness. He wanted to do the same for his own kids, wanted to give back to his parents by providing them with grandchildren. If he could have all of that with Luke instead, there would be no contest. He faced a tough decision, and he didn't have much time left to make it. After all, Tomorrow was photo day. You and Luke could have started a family together, Shane pointed out. They were seated at a table in one corner of the living room, the steaming food on their plate still too hot to eat. I know that now, Ryder said, rubbing his forehead wearily. But back then, it seemed impossible. I must have been 15? This was before I could drive, so that sounds right. Either way, I was a clueless teenager, and most of what I wanted wasn't legal yet. So when Luke gave you his photo? It was one of the most beautiful moments of my life, Ryder said. I knew what he was confessing, but I was still caught up in the idea that I had a choice. Madison and I had fun at the mall that afternoon. I remember the fountain. She had gone to use the restroom, and I was sitting there alone, watching kids drag their parents toward the toy store or chasing each other around the legs of the adults. I saw all of that while holding both of their photos. I couldn't bring myself to give up my dream of a family, so I made my decision and let one of them go. By drowning him in a fountain, Shane teased. Ryder shook his head and laughed. It's not like I could tear Luke's photo up or crumple it into a ball. I couldn't keep it either. It would have haunted me, so in my mind, I was placing him on the water to be carried out to sea. The suburban equivalent, at least. Yeah. The photo you have is really the same one? How did you find it? Shane told him everything as they ate, even the more outlandish fantasies he'd had about Colby, embarrassing as they were. So you've always wanted to sail away to somewhere new, Ryder commented. Huh, I guess so. I never really thought about it that way. I could have pretended that Colby went to the same school as me and lived down the street. Then again, he wasn't real, so why not dream big? Ryder used his fork to smush the last remaining grains of rice on the plate. Then he shoved it all aside. Speaking of which, how is work today? Any news? He meant the job offer, a topic they discussed daily, or in a few instances argued about. I haven't given them an answer yet. Shane cleared his throat, choosing the angle he felt Ryder would appreciate most. It would mean more money. How much more? Because if you move in with me, your rent and bills would be halved. We could put a deposit down on a house sooner that way. And adopt kids? Eventually, when you're ready. And when we do have kids, we'll have family nearby to help take care of them. I want our children to know their grandparents. And I want them to see more than Kansas, Shane shot back, his temper rising. He took a deep breath to study it again. Why get into an argument about raising kids they didn't actually have? He changed topics instead. Are you bisexual? Ryder blinked in surprise. You mean because of Madison? He shook his head. I don't think so. She was a great girlfriend, really fun to be around. We did everything together. 
including the physical side, but I don't think that makes me bisexual. Why not? Because I never fell in love with her. That feeling I had with Luke, I kept waiting for it to show up, like my mother talked about, but it never did. I don't think she would have given me the same advice had she known that I'm gay. How could she have when even I wasn't sure? I wish I'd been brave enough to talk about my confusion because she might have helped me figure that out. They've been nothing but supportive since I did. It kills me to look back on it all now. I should have been with Luke. I loved Madison as a friend and am glad we got so close, but all the romantic stuff? I wish I could have discovered that with him. Hopefully I didn't mess him up too bad. Is he happy? He seemed okay to me, although he's still not over you. Ryder smiled at this news. He's not? Nope, he even said as much. Wow. What about you? Are you over Colby? Or into his real-life counterpart? You really need to ask? Shane batted his eyelashes. Actions speak louder than words. Follow me to the bedroom and I'll show you who I'm into. Everything for everyone. That was the philosophy behind the shopping mall. And nowhere was this principle on greater display than the food court. Don't like Chinese food? No problem. Grab yourself a burger and fries. Watching your weight? Have a pita stuffed with salad instead. Those who preferred finer cuisine could choose to dine at one of the mall's restaurants. But generally, no matter who was hungry for what, something could be found at the food court to match their tastes. He was curious to see what Luke would choose. Shane had driven here from Legends, the mall where he worked, since he was allowed an entire hour for lunch. As the store's manager, he could take even longer if he chose. Luke only got half an hour, which is probably why he started eating the moment they were seated. He looked up self-consciously after the first few bites, fried chicken dangling from one corner of his mouth, which he quickly inhaled. What? Nothing. I'm just surprised. Colby was a vegetarian. Was he? Luke looked down at Shane's veggie wrap and cup of tomato soup. Are you? No, I only managed to be for a few years, although I still don't eat a lot of meat. Colby was always encouraging me to give it up. Animals were very important to him. And yet, he still wanted them to be the servants of your island mansion, Luke said wryly. Hey, it's not easy training an ostrich to do the dishes or whatever. That takes trust, which is easier to establish when you aren't eating their kin. For the record, we would have been on friendly terms with our staff, kind of like Downton Abbey. Meaning you'd occasionally grace them with your presence by showing up downstairs in their dungeon quarters or by allowing them to join the Christmas party after all the other guests had gone home. It doesn't get more generous than that. Luke laughed. Is that really how you imagined it? Shane shook his head. They were more like pets that helped out around the house. We would all eat at the same table, for instance, or read in the backyard while sunbathing. The animals too? Yep. It's a miracle your parents never had you committed. There's a reason I kept it all secret, Shane said. That was Colby's idea. Luke finished off a chicken leg. It's a good thing you didn't meet me back then, he said after swallowing. Why's that? You would have been devastated. I've always been a ravenous carnivore and I'm terrible at keeping secrets. I'm sure I would have liked you anyway. Shane said, seeing as you're real and all, that would have had definite advantages. What about Ryder? Does he have much in common with Colby? Shane snorted. Oh no, almost nothing in fact. That's caused some tension lately. How so? Shane exhaled. Ah, the company I work for offered me a promotion a few weeks back. I'd be their Southeast Divisional Manager. That's great. Congratulations. Thanks. The only catch is that I'd have to move. I'm up for it, but Ryder wants to stay here. Because of his work? 
Because of his family, Luke grinned. Ah, I remember them. They were great. Good people for sure. I like my own family too, but I don't need my entire life to revolve around them. Weird, Luke said, sounding surprised. I don't remember him being so attached to his family, Shane shrugged. I think it has more to do with his kids. Kids? Yeah. Do you want any? Luke narrowed his eyes. So you're telling me that not only does Ryder have kids already, but you want to give them away? Shane replayed the conversation in his head and laughed. <laughs> oh, sorry. No, Ryder wants kids more than anything. Do you? Luke nodded. Sure. So does Ryder. I'm only now realizing just how important that is to him. I get it, Luke said. He wants your families to be nearby when you become parents. That makes sense. As I said, he's practical. Right, but it's also thoughtful. My dad was a regional manager too. Oh yeah? Luke nodded. That's why we moved so often. Every couple of years he would be sent to a new city, get those offices running smoothly, and then be shipped off to the next place. Rinse and repeat. Did you like it? Enough to keep doing that as an adult. I moved up and down the West Coast and loved it, but there's a reason I came back here. You mean it wasn't to find me? Luke smiled. No, I felt too untethered. My parents returned to Kansas City after they retired. All my relatives live within driving distance of here. I like that. Growing up, I never had a steady social circle or went to the same school for long. Lately, my friends have been talking about their upcoming high school reunions 10 years since graduation. Can you believe it? But I don't know where I would go for mine. I never really belonged anywhere, so if I had kids, I'd probably do things differently. Shane thought about this while chewing and swallowing. Sounds like you would have appreciated the stability. I could imagine settling down to start a family, but not yet. There's still so much I haven't seen. The whole world, really. Luke sat up straight, his eyes bright. It's worth seeing. I bet you could talk Ryder into joining you, even if he's resistant at first. Maybe he would, if I promised him everything else he wants after we got back. Or you could do both, and have a family while on the move. It didn't damage me or anything, and hey, it's the perfect excuse to get that houseboat you've always wanted. Shane grinned. I still like window shopping for those online, especially when there are video tours. I'm not surprised, Luke said, digging into a paper cup filled with mashed potatoes. Fits in with my theory. About me? Yep. Luke swallowed a heaping spoonful before continuing. I'm not sure Colby was your dream guy. Are you kidding? Of course he was. And yet... You've ended up with someone who is nothing like him. Or is Ryder a vegetarian now? He's not, but hear me out. You dreamt up this seemingly perfect man who was always encouraging you to be more like him. The vegetarian thing? Or how when you started dating other people you took your cues from your imaginary relationship with him? I noticed you were drinking wine the other day too, just like Colby taught you, I bet. He was living the life you'd always wanted, traveling the world, never in the same place for long. Don't you see? Colby wasn't your dream guy. He was your ideal self. Shane felt like the world had been turned upside down, leaving him tumbling through the air. If you're right, and you might be, I need to think about it more. Then that means I was secretly dating myself for all those years? Luke chuckled. Sure, but that's true no matter which way you slice it. Oh man, Shane groaned. You're right. Does this mean I'm a narcissist? Do I come across as full of myself? No, but you seem like someone who knows what he wants. I only wish that was true. Especially after the constant debate of the past few weeks. Would he take the job or wouldn't he? Now I know how Ryder felt, having to choose between two different futures. 
What do you mean? Oh, it has to do with your history together. I could spill all the details, but it would mean more coming from him. You two should meet up. No way, Luke said, shaking his head. Those feelings are still too raw. Talking to you about it the other day brought them back to the surface. He's still emotional about it too, Shane said. So you'll both feel that way. I can't do it. Sorry. And do you really want me drooling over your man? It's a bad idea. Especially if you want to keep him. Shane did. He loved Ryder. None of his other relationships had felt as good as this one did. And yet... Part of him was dissatisfied and always had been, not with Ryder, but himself. You could still tell me everything he said, Luke pressed, since I won't hear it any other way. Okay, right now? Luke checked his watch and sighed. <sighs> Some other time? I have to get going too, Shane said. I don't want to be late. Not with a promotion on the table, Luke said as he stood. How much longer do you have to decide? Tomorrow? That's when I need to give them my answer. They hugged as they parted, Shane realizing that the decision Ryder had once faced was indeed his own now. Would he keep the photo of the boy he loved? Or cast it into the fountain to chase after an unlikely dream? Legends Outlets was an outdoor mall. Not a strip mall. Those weren't worthy of the name. An outdoor mall operated under the same concept as their more traditional counterparts. After parking in the surrounding lot, the shopper had a maze of stores and eateries to choose from, all within a short stroll of each other. The only difference was the lack of a roof over the corridors. This could be beautiful during ideal weather when the skies were blue and the sun was shining. Or it could mean racing to the car while eyeing clouds heavy with rain, making Shane wonder why the architects had skimped on roofs. The bad weather scared away more customers than it lured in during more favorable conditions. If he was in charge... Ha! What a thought! He supposed he was in charge, now more than ever. Shane looked up, having reached the parking lot, and saw someone standing by his car. He was just as handsome as any guy from his fantasies, even more so. He certainly looked good dressed in a full suit, and as for the bouquet of flowers, Shane sighed, of all the days for Ryder to make an exception. What are you doing here? Shane asked, accepting the flowers along with a kiss. I'm either here to celebrate your new job, or that you decided to stay, but I know you well enough that I don't need to ask. Shane swallowed, his throat feeling tight. I'm sorry. Don't be. I know how bad you wanted this. The rain chose that moment to fall, but Ryder's car wasn't far. Only a few drops had hit them before they made it safely inside. I'm coming with you, Ryder said. I started looking at job listings today. I found some in Atlanta that are promising. It's Miami, actually. Shane said, already feeling guilty. Atlanta will probably be the year after. Florida? I thought they said you'd be in the same state for years at a time. They did, but... Shane shrugged. Plans change, especially with a job like this. Okay, Ryder said. Miami, then. That shouldn't be much different. I'll start looking tomorrow, and... Did you give notice already? At work. No? Good. Ryder studied him. What's that supposed to mean? Shane answered him with another question, making sure his tone was gentle. How about your parents? Have you told them? We could call your mom right now. Ryder grew quiet. Then his face began to crumple, just before he took a sudden interest in the driver's side window. I've wanted this for a long time, Shane said. Some dreams come and go, but the important ones stick around. That's how it's always been for me. And for you. The advice your mom gave you in high school was right. It's important to find someone who wants the same things as you. Ryder turned to face him again, wet trails marking his cheeks. But I love you. 
I love you too. Enough that I want us both to be happy. I don't think you will be if I stay. I'll resent you for being what keeps me here. If you come with me, and believe me, I would love that, I think the same will happen to you. This can either tear us apart later, when it all goes to hell, or we can end things now, while they're still good. Ryder pushed himself out of his seat, reaching to take Shane's head into his hands, fresh tears streaming down both their faces. When they kissed, it was filled with adoration. But it also felt like saying goodbye. I'm going to miss your mom, Shane said, leaning the car seat back and letting the afternoon sun warm his face. Not as much as my dad is going to miss you, Ryder said, flicking the turn signal as the car came to a stop at a red light. I can't believe he cried. He's never liked any of my boyfriends as much as you, or at all. I thought about inviting him to move down to Florida with me, Shane said with a snort. Oh, wouldn't that be something? I could be your new stepdaddy. Ha ha, Ryder deadpanned as he pushed down on the accelerator again. What did you and my mom talk about? When we were locked in her bedroom? Yeah, she wouldn't tell me. Then neither will I. Hey, don't get on the highway just yet. Keep going. I have an errand I need to run. Where to? It's just ahead. I need to pick up more boxes. Ryder glanced over at him, expression vulnerable. They were doing okay, having had a couple weeks to get used to the new situation. Being friends was weird, but the breakup sex had been phenomenal. You would have finished packing by now if we were still together. Count yourself lucky then, because we both know you would have done all the work. In my own defense, I'm mostly finished. Only the kitchen is left. I better get my ass in gear anyway. The movers come on Thursday. I leave on Friday. Oh, yeah. <sighs> to be honest, I'm kind of terrified. You're going to love it, Ryder said. I know you will. Think you'll come visit sometime? <laughs> Just try and stop me. Shane lulled his head to the side, smiling at his former boyfriend. He couldn't help feeling sad, knowing that they might drift apart. That was natural, too. But he hoped they would keep their promise and manage to stay friends. Should I stop at this grocery store? Ryder asked. They'll have banana boxes. They're nice and sturdy. And sticky and smelly. No, there's one of those packing shops at the mall. Antioch Center? I thought it closed down. Yeah, it's Antioch Crossing now. They rebuilt it. Oh, have you been there since they reopened? Just once. Park over there. The store isn't far. They walked across the parking lot in silence, Ryder laughing when they reached the entrance. Man, he said, this used to be my second home. It's hard to understand how they went out of business. When school was out, we'd all come here. That's how it seemed anyway. I wonder what kids do now. Stare at their phones while browsing Amazon together? No idea. They need somewhere like this. It might not be the best place to shop, but it's perfect for hanging out. Rain or shine. They walked through a department store, Shane feeling reverence for a dying industry. Even the company he worked for was moving stores to outdoor locations or downsizing them to be in the corner of a larger retailer. The way people shopped would never be the same again. He probably should have considered that before accepting his new position, but he didn't have any regrets. No matter what happened when he got there, at least it would be somewhere new. Where to? Ryder asked when they reached the mall proper. Corridors lit by skylights, mellow piped-in music, and the alluring scent of freshly baked cookies. Shane still thought it was the best place on earth. Good for so much more than just spending money. Entire lives could change here. They had, and they would. This is where we part ways, Shane said, turning to face him. I'll catch an Uber back to my place. I figure you'll be too busy. Ryder shook his head, not understanding. Doing what? Didn't you hear? Shane said, taking something out of his pocket. It's photo day. Ryder squinted at the small paper rectangle he was handed. Then he laughed. 
This is what you were talking to my mother about? Who else would still have uncut sheets of your old school photos? Which was excellent, because Shane had kept one for himself, although he could have left with a pocket full if he hadn't declined. She literally had every single year in order. She's one hell of a mom. Ryder searched his eyes. Then he glanced around. You set this up, didn't you? Yes. He's here? Shane nodded. Is that okay? Yeah. Ryder's chin began to tremble before he got himself under control. Definitely. Where do I... Shane turned and pointed. See that fountain up ahead? It wasn't the same one. That had been demolished years ago, but another comfort of shopping malls is that they all felt more or less the same. And do you see the guy pacing nervously in front of it? Oh, God, Ryder breathed. I can't. You can, and you will, because it's one thing for a teenager to make a dumb mistake. But you're way too smart now, and handsome, and sweet, and holy crap. I can't believe I'm doing this, but it's the right thing. Trust me. No matter what, this needs to happen, for both your sakes. They might end up being friends and nothing more. Maybe it would only be a fling. Or, who knew, they could get hitched someday and raise a family together. No matter what happened, at least they would have a chance to make up for past regrets and missed opportunities. What about you? Ryder asked. Shane laughed. I'll let you know when I get there. Go on now. Don't keep him waiting. Ryder didn't run off just yet. He threw his arms around Shane, hugging him tight. Then he stepped back, wiping the tears from his eyes. How do I look? He asked. Like the best thing I ever let get away, Shane said with a heavy heart. He hadn't expected this to be so difficult. Now go. This time, Ryder listened. He walked away, forcing himself to stand up straight as he neared the fountain. He didn't hesitate when Luke spotted him. Ryder raised a hand in greeting, and when they stood in front of each other, they shook their heads bashfully and laughed. Ryder held something out. Luke accepted it before giving him something in return. For the second time, the photo that had lived for so long in Shane's wallet was gone, replaced by the one he had gotten from Ryder's mother. So not everything had changed. Shane would still be carrying his dream guy around with him, wherever he went. He watched as Ryder and Luke sat together on a bench, too lost in conversation to remember him. With a lump in his throat, he turned to leave, just as Ryder looked up sharply. Shane only lingered long enough to wave goodbye, swallowing against the melancholy he felt. He walked away and managed to smile. No more lingering on the past, especially when the future held so much potential. He was off to new adventures and faraway lands, where Colby would finally be free to step out of his imagination and into reality. A gay teenager walks the thin line between friendship and love in Straight Boy, a book by J. Bell. Available as an audiobook, ebook, or paperback at your favorite retailer. Former high school sweethearts continue to meet over the years, their relationship changing with each encounter in Something Like Summer. A book by J. Bell. Available as an audiobook, ebook, or paperback at your favorite retailer.